fiscal year in terms of fundraising, we raised about $116,000, $117,000 in 2020, up from roughly 70 in uh, in our inaugural 2019 year. Um, and the really great thing about it is we've gotten the community uh, a lot more into the fundraising. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, uh, part of what we do is, is aid the community in any efforts that they want to do in fundraising. Um, we're here to help and, and offer guidance um, in those efforts. Uh, and in doing so, we've did more than doubled our number of donors. Um, so that's been really great. You know, year number one was kind of a family and friends effort um, and, and the community has gotten a lot more involved, uh, which is truly uh, a blessing to see. Um, we've run the organization very lean this far. As we grow, we anticipate expenses, you know, will rise naturally. Um, you know, as we get larger, there's going to be kind of more hurdles that we have to run through. But thus far, we've been able to uh, to keep expenses extremely lean, uh, running at less than 3% of our of our total dollars raised. Um, so that's been awesome. So for every dollar raised, there's, you know, there's 97 cents to go to research, um, which is really, really great. Um, so far for 2021, we are, uh, we're off to a good start. We're already into July here. Um, we've raised about $70,000 year to date. Uh, so if we stay at that pace, we will eclipse 2020, um, but there's still definitely work to be done. Um, you know, the world's not fully open yet, but we're getting there. So to the extent we can continue to branch off of community involvement and community-based fundraising, um, you know, we've got roughly 130 on our registry thus far. I believe there's roughly 540 on our Facebook group. Um, there's strength in numbers I and mean, we certainly can't do it alone. So we need to continue to have communities involvement uh, in these efforts and, and help us to continue to, to raise dollars. Because again, the, the vast majority of these dollars um, are all going to research. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind in fundraising efforts and, and when anybody donates and you can do so through our website, um, via check, how, however it's easiest for you, always try and in, in encourage corporate matching. Uh, a lot of folks don't always realize that they have corporate matching, but that's a incremental source of, of, of research dollars um, and a pretty material one. And another real easy way, um, obviously in the last year and a half with us all being at home, I think everybody's gotten pretty familiar with their Amazon accounts. Um, you can go just like Amazon, it's the same exact interface, the same exact login, the same exact info, make all your purchases through Smile. Uh, Amazon Smile will donate um, half a percent of total top line revenue to a charity of your choosing um, of which ACT is listed. So again, you know, just routine things um, actually add up to material dollars. So these are easy ways for us to continue to, to, to fundraise um, and, and, you know, continue to fund research is really going to help our kids. Um, I'll let Lauren talk a little bit kind of about where we're at in our kind of research timeline. And obviously uh, Michelle is gonna go into much more depth shortly. Uh, yes, yeah, so Dr. Jacob will go into a lot more detail, but we're so excited that the funding that we've raised thus far has resulted in having really valuable mouse models that have been developed. Um, there's drug testing underway that Dr. Jacob and um, Dr. Alexander will be speaking about, um, some very exciting updates taking place. Um, and then I'm just kind of hammering in the need to register in Simons because that registry and natural history study are so, so important for us as um, we start to prepare for next steps, um, God willing, moving towards clinical trials. So we need everyone registered um, on Simon Searchlight. We um, have a lot of families that are registered, but we need more lab reports that are submitted and the medical history. It really does not take that long. Um, you know, I've been through the process with Declan. It's well worth um, the time investment to do this. We have about um, 300, you know, children approximately diagnosed. So you can see we have 130 families that are registered. We need to up that number. Um, so just encouraging everyone to please do that. Um, to our right, you kind of see the path to treatment of what we've completed thus far, what's underway, what's coming up next. Dr. Michelle Jacob will be speaking about that a little bit more. Um, but this is kind of where we're at. And um, I should also mention that we're in the process of launching a new um, website 
where this path to treatment will be on there and a lot more information on fundraising and our registry. It'll be a lot more robust that everyone can reference and will hopefully be helpful. So um, with that, I'm actually gonna hand it over to Alex and to Nicole um, to talk about some exciting next steps in helping support the community with Seesaw. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Sean. Um, my, my name is Alex DeShiel, and I'm joined here with my wife, Nicole DeShiel. Um, you know, very excited to, to be um, not only part of this community and part of this organization, but, um, but very excited to hear about all of the, the exciting work that, that our, our community of researchers has done, done um, some amazing work today. Um, I think what we would like to, um, to share um, is, is, I think as many of you know, we have been working very closely with Seesaw for about a year now, and we've had conversations around putting our organizations together. And so happy to report that we've, we've made great progress. We have our respective board approvals to move, to move forward with, with um, finalizing a merger. Um, I will let um, uh, Mariana Parks um, from the Seesaw organization walk through um, the timeline of that. Um, but we think it, it will bring many benefits to, um, to the community and, and to our collective efforts here. Uh, number one, we'll have a unified approach in terms of how we communicate with the scientific community and, and frankly, how we reach out to our broader CT and NB1 community. Um, and we think uh, by having a unified approach, um, that will serve us uh, very well in the long term. Um, and then, frankly, it eliminates a lot of redundancies, both in terms of, of administrative redundancies, um, which will allow us to run two organizations uh, into one, which will allow us to run more efficiently. So that's from an administrative standpoint. We can have one accounting firm, one set of bank accounts, um, one set of organizational fees, um, one set of, of compliance um, fees. And so all of those um, will help, um, to Sean's point, make sure that we always keep our expenses as low as possible um, and frankly, allow us to spend more time on what we all want to do, which is um, raise awareness and raise, um, and raise dollars for research. Um, and, then, and then lastly, um, I think it very much also allows us um, to broaden the reach of our organization. Um, as, as Lauren mentioned, um, we've had um, the, the fortunate um, um, that a lot of families want to help and join. And I think with a combined organization, there'll be a lot more needs for, for folks to, to help us on the research front and to help us, um, to help us on the fundraising um, Front. So we think this, this combined organization will serve the community well. Um, we're excited by it. We're excited by the progress that we can make. Um, with that, I'll turn it over um, to Mariana and she can walk through uh, a bit on the, on the timeline and, um, and also some of the benefits um, that she views. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. I'm Mariana Parks. I'm the president of Seesaw, which, as most of you know, stands for CTNN B1 Syndrome Awareness Worldwide. When we were founded, our goals were uh, awareness throughout uh, the, the research and parent community a connection with each other and access to resources. So when it makes sense, uh, research is obviously uh, closely connected with that. Lauren has served on our board. Um, I wanna thank her for the work she's done on that and Alex for the work that he's done in helping us figure out legally, how do we take care of this uh, merger? It's, it's never simple when it uh, has regulatory implications, but uh, thank you, Alex, for the work you've done on that. Also wanna thank Kayla, who is uh, gonna be involved in that. The rest of our board, uh, Annie Wood, Bethany Dalberto and uh, Patrice um, Bradley have been on our board. Um, the timeline, as most of you know, our, our um, uh, symbol for CTNMB1 is a dragonfly. And the little research we found out that in a lot of countries around the world, the dragonfly day is July 25th. So that's become our CTNMB1 day, which is next weekend. To Alex's point, what we want to do is announce uh, to the broader public uh, about our merger. We'll be spending the, the rest of uh, 
uh, this year to uh, all of the things that need to be integrated, but um, the vote by both boards has been taken and we are moving forward with that legally. We're very excited about it. Um, and so um, look forward, as I talked about with uh, fundraising on July 25th, we often do a fundraising push with Amazon, other things. We'll be sending out a newsletter and, and our websites and uh, Facebook pages will uh, talk about that. So we're very excited about it. And um, in a post-COVID world, uh, maybe we'll be able to do some, some more robust meetups regionally, um, get to know each other a little bit better. And uh, anyway, thank you very much uh, for your work, Alex and, and Lauren and Sean and Nicole for this and Kayla for helping us uh, stitch the two groups together. So we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, and with that, um, we are gonna turn the conference over to Dr. Wendy Chung from Columbia University to get us started. Thank you so much. Thanks. Let me make sure I can share my screen here. And hopefully you're seeing everything. Oops. Okay, very good. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Wendy Chung. I'm a medical geneticist based out of Columbia University, and I also run the Simon Searchlight Study. And I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, on your program, I took things just slightly out of order, but I'll present all the topics that are on your program. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. And if anyone's interested in any of the data, we'll post this. So don't feel like you've got to voraciously take notes. Um, I'm starting with just a very brief primer um, in terms of setting the stage for understanding some of the information I'm going to present. I think most people know that um, their children or their loved one has a change uh, in the cells in their body. For most of you, it's all the cells in the body that change one of the DNA letters. And in some cases, it's just one single letter out of three billion of those letters. And that change is a genetic variation that's been present for most of the children um, or adults uh, from the time they were conceived and going forward. And it's what's responsible for the changes that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm showing you just how to read your lab report because some of you are going to be, uh, it'll make it a little bit more, make more sense. Um, and it is one of the things this lab report, if you can dig it out of your files, is one of the requisites, as you'll see, for us to make sure that you're in the right club. Um, and this is actually a different gene. So this is not me meant to re be representative uh, for CTN and B1, um, but it's a generic lab report that many of you probably have either this one or something like it. And the part that we're reading to look for is this line here that tells us what the gene is, what the particular variant is. And I'll get back to this de novo idea, uh, but we're looking for this word positive here. So to make sure you're in the right club, we wanna make sure that this is in fact the gene difference um, that's in your child. And so that's, that's why I put that in here. Um, just very briefly, de novo simply means that the genetic change that we're talking about in beta catenin um, that's another way of saying that same gobbledygook in terms of the CTN and B1. Um, this genetic change is de novo, meaning that it's new in the child. Um, and this is something that it, for a second sort of throws you for a loop because it's genetic, but it's not inherited. So in terms of the parent's DNA, for most of you, when we looked at your blood or looked at a saliva sample, we didn't see that genetic variant. We only saw it in your child, and that's because it was not inherited. It started either in one of the egg cells or one of the sperm cells or started shortly after the time of conception, right after fertilization. We can't necessarily tell the difference in terms of where it came in, in that entire process, but the point is that it's new in the child. And importantly, for those of you who may have young children and have families, what that often means to us is that it's not likely to genetically be an issue for either a future pregnancy you would have if you're planning on having future children, or if you have brothers or sisters or nieces or nephews or your children are having children, um, it's really not an issue for other people in the family. It's just for that one individual. 
The other thing I want to say, and I, I always say this, but I want to say it loud and clear because some of you uh, I haven't spoken with before, um, there's nothing that you did that caused this. So very clearly, there's nothing in terms of any exposure. If you used a certain cleaning product, if you had a glass of wine before you knew you were pregnant, if you forgot your prenatal vitamin one day, it has nothing to do with any of this. Um, this is no fault in terms of how this starts. Um, so just very briefly, a little bit of language. Like I said, out of 3 billion of those alphabet letters, it's usually just one genetic change. And for most of you, that change um, leads to the failure to produce uh, the normal amount of the beta catenin protein. So this is the DNA that we read out, and that gets uh, made into a protein. That's what these beads on the string are meant to represent. Each of these a single amino acid. And many times, this DNA change that I'm showing over here results in not making the full length protein. So it causes what we call a termination or an abrupt end to making the protein, or it might not make any protein at all. So that leads to insufficient amounts of the beta catenin. And that's really key, and you're going to hear more about it later. The question is, is there a way to bring up, either turn up the volume or bring up the levels of beta catenin or compensate for what's usually about half the normal amount. Very rarely, we see what we call missense variants. And this one, again, uh, change in the DNA still results in a protein, but there's a change in the composition of one amino acid here. And again, that's the exception rather than the rule for this group. Uh, but I put it in there just in case there's someone out there who might have that change. So let me switch gears for a second and talk about Simon's Searchlight. Um, you've heard a lot about this already. Uh, we try and make this as easy as possible, but I know it's still not easy because life is just complicated and busy. It's open to anyone around the world, and we have many different languages in terms of uh, people able to support um, over half a dozen different languages, as well as a translation service for people who speak other languages beyond that. And this is meant to be understanding what I call the natural history, or normally uh, what you're seeing to be able to share with each other and to share with researchers, as well as to prepare for clinical trials. That is, when we get to the point of being able to test a new medicine or something that might change things, be able to understand the before so that we can understand and compare it to the after, what happens when we actually test a new medicine. Um, one of the other things that we do that I'll get to in a second is also to collect uh, samples, blood samples in particular, and those can be extremely helpful in terms of being able to test out either a medicine or a treatment in a dish before we put it in a person. So by taking from cells from an individual, um, we're able to do things to test things out, ex literally experiment and see if something might work before exposing someone to a treatment that we don't know if it has toxicity, if it has uh, side effects or something that might be an issue. As we do this, I want to be clear, um, this is entirely financially supported by the Simons Foundation, so it doesn't cost the foundation a penny to do this. It's completely free, uh, and it's not going anywhere. I've been doing this already for 10 years, and it's going to be going for decades into the future. And we de-identify the information so that no one knows who you are, but then it's freely available to all researchers around the world. So this is a way of being able to, for you, um, essentially do your part once and have it amplified in terms of many, many other people being able to use the same information. Um, so let me just give you a little update in terms of where we are for the community. Uh, these are the steps that uh, people go through in terms of doing this, and I put this up there, this in part because I know we've been um, working hard to make it easier, but I know people still get stuck. So we've got about 122 people who are currently registered in the system, um, and 76 or uh, about two thirds of you have gotten to the point of uploading that genetic test report I showed you, being able to upload it in the system. Um, this is important, as I said, for us to be able to make sure that uh, you have the right diagnosis, and, and I would say across the conditions that I study, it's about 96% of people who, in fact, when they think they're in a group, really belong in that group. Um, but there are a few people who actually end up, we, we redirect traffic and hopefully get people to the right group they need to be a part of. After that, we talk to you on the phone, and this is with one of my genetic counselors um, who knows about the condition. Most of the families tell us it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to someone who actually knows something about the condition. Um, so, And we do do this in a way that people can do it off hours 
hours and realizing that people are around the world trying to make sure it's convenient for you. After that, we have a series of online surveys and I'll warn you that these actually continue onward and it's not just a one and done. You actually end up doing this every year as I'll show you because we wanna see how your child is changing over time. That ends up being really important in terms of preparing for clinical trials. And finally, as I said, getting a blood sample. I know under COVID, it was really hard to think about um, being safe and going to a place to get blood drawn. And I know it's not easy to draw blood for some of your kids, um, but this I'm gonna emphasize here um, is it's, we really need a blood drive right now, essentially to be able to get the cells we need to do some of the critical studies um, that you're gonna hear from uh, the in, right after me in terms of some of the basic science. Um, so with this, in terms of the cells that we have, um, one of the things that we do, as I said, is to try and understand what I call biomarkers. So is there something in the blood that we can measure to understand what's going on with beta catenin levels? Uh, so can we use that as a surrogate to see what our treatment might be doing? as well as can we make these into something called induced pluripotential stem cells. And I apologize, that's actually a typo right there. Um, but right now we, we actually don't have any for the group, but we are willing to make them again, free of charge to the foundation. So that ends up costing us about $13,000 per person that we do this for, but we're willing to do that entirely for free. Um, we've set up a system in the United States and I will say it's easier for us right now in the United States because for COVID, it's still a little challenging to get international shipments going um, and through customs and cells getting stuck in customs. But right now in the United States, we have a contract with Quest Laboratories so that if you sign up to do this, you can go to one of your local Quest Laboratories with a box that we send you, get your blood drawn, it gets FedEx back to us. And then with that uh, made into these induced pluripotential stem cells, um, it does take between six and nine months to make those uh, induced pluripotential stem cells. So we're trying to, as I said, get this done now so that hopefully a year from now, we'll have a lot of what researchers need to be able to test some of the things that they're thinking about in cells that are actually end up being brain cells, believe it or not. We can take a blood cell and make it into a brain cell and test it to see what effects there might be on the brain. So now I'm going to dive into the heart of the results. And um, I don't know that the, most of the families, this will be a little bit of gobbledygook, so I apologize, uh, but this is here mostly for the researchers. Um, this is an inventory of all the different genetic variations that we see in the community that's registered right now. As I said, if you look at this in terms of just the ones that we would call um, sort of nonsense or frame shift uh, different types once that stop making the protein, the majority of individuals in our community are in that class. And in terms of our certainty that these are in fact the right answer, anything that's labeled pathogenic or likely pathogenic, we're sure you're in the right club. Um, so that's, you know, you found the right place, you found the right home, all that's good. Um, this is what I was saying before, there are a very, very small number of these missense variants, and uh, all of them are not certain. In fact, one of them is uncertain, a so-called variant of uncertain significance, um, but for uh, even for these that are missense, they've been labeled by the laboratories as likely the answer or likely pathogenic. Um, so for most of what you're going to hear us talk about, we're going on the assumption that the problem in the brain is not having enough beta catenin, that you have about half the normal amount and that we need some way of being able to ramp that up. And so you'll hear us sort of for shorthand talking about that later today. Okay, so let's now get into what we know about the condition from a medical point of view, from a developmental point of view, from an everyday life point of view. So these are the individuals that are a summary of the data I'm gonna show you. There are some limitations, so I'll be, try and point these out. Um, it's based on 36 individuals who went through and did these talking to the genetic counselors and filling out these surveys. Um, and this is a distribution on the x-axis by age in years, and then the frequency on the y-axis. So what you'll see is is that most of the data I'm gonna show you are about individuals that are less than 10 years of age. We do have a few who are in adolescence and a very small number who are young adults, but most of the information is coming from younger children. So that does have some limitations in terms of some of you obviously having young children and wondering what's, what's my child gonna be like when they're 25 or 35 or 45. Um, and, and I don't know the answer for the 35 or 45 yet. So stay tuned for that. 
um, most of the things that we're seeing are what I call above the shoulders. So it's mostly about the brain and behavior and effects that the brain and behavior have in terms of other parts of the body. That's generally a way to think about it. The other take home message I'll give you is that it tends to be a condition where individuals don't regress, they don't lose skills, they don't fall back, they don't deteriorate, they continue to make forward progress. It's just that that progress is slower than other children. And so again, marching forward, developing forward. And in general, one of the things um, I've noticed is that I think the children in this generation, so to speak, are doing a little bit better than the children in the past generations. That is, I think that earlier diagnosis, earlier in intervention, some improved strategies in terms of education are actually helping and iteratively, and I think this is important, iteratively helping us to give our kids a better chance. And so I encourage what you're already doing, but is to systematically, I guess is the one thing I would say, systematically share and let's rigorously try and assess which things are working so that we can all be able to use those best practices in terms of helping our kids be their best. Um, we are seeing some uh, issues. Um, and again, I don't think this will be surprising for most of you. Everyone has some degree of developmental delay or intellectual disability. But again, that's not surprising that it just takes them a little bit longer to learn things. Um, in particular, learning language and speaking and speaking clearly uh, is obviously, and again, remember that most of these are young children, uh, sort of front of mind in terms of thinking about this. Um, it's definitely not the majority, but a small group of individuals do have either autism or autistic-like features. Um, and some of the strategies that we use, ABA therapy in particular, I found to be helpful uh, definitely for the individuals with autism, but I'll also say for individuals without an autism diagnosis, just being able to have one-on-one -on -one attention, really intense uh, help and, and being able to repeat things over and over again until individuals really get them and have them really learned and are solid in those skills. Um, that type of teaching strategy has been helpful actually across the community. There are some issues that come with attention or being able to focus or getting easily distracted. I'm seeing this more the older the children get, um, but we can see it across the age spectrum. And uh, sometimes issues come up in terms of anxiety or obsessiveness or you know sort of doing the same thing over time and time again and some of that relates to these individuals also who have autism may have some of these other features um, i do think this is going to change over the life course and i think it changes over life circumstances and i'll just put out there that COVID, i think has been a real stressor for our community in terms of um, not having the in-person attention in some cases at least for long times or having the time uh, in terms of with your therapist cut short or things just switching around and, and sort of that being unsettling. For some individuals, it actually, I, I will say, I try and think of COVID lemonade, if there's any lemonade that we've made from the lemons. And I have heard in certain circumstances that certain changes just been forced upon us have been helpful. And so as you see those, do try and take those post-COVID in terms of learnings. Um, so the other things we've seen in terms of neurological conditions, I, I will say that um, I think these are mostly the things that, like I said, are related to the brain and the effects that we see in other parts of the body. We definitely see hypotonia or low muscle tone, but also you'll see that about half of individuals also have some parts of their body with high muscle tone. So individuals can have both hypo and hypertonia in different parts of the body. Important to work with your physical therapist in terms of making the body as strong as you can be, as well as if there are areas of hypertonia doing stretching exercises so that you don't end up with problems in terms of contractures. Then in certain cases, um, people have found it helpful to have AFOs or braces to help in terms of initially walking and being able to be steady on your feet and try and prevent falls and uh, injuries as well. Um, problems that we see also in terms of movement. So as individuals are learning to uh, whether it's walk or go up and down stairs or just being able to move their body um, is that individuals are having trouble with coordination. They're just not the most graceful. Um, you know, it takes a while in terms of building in that motor memory to be smooth in terms of those movements. They do come in, it just takes practice, practice, practice. Um, and it, it can take in some cases quite a lot of practice. Um, but working with your physical therapist, making this fun. If some of you are able to go to gyms um, where they have certain adaptive equipment, I've been really impressed 
suggested some of the things that therapists have been coming up in terms of adaptive equipment to help support the body, to be able to improve that hypotonia and to help with the coordination. Um, so there, and definitely if amongst you, you may share, it doesn't have to be other families with children with special needs and, and beta catenin, but there are many other children with similar but other neurogenetic conditions and the same types of supports actually help across those. Um, cerebral palsy is something that gets diagnosed. I actually don't think almost any of the children have true cerebral palsy. Um, they may have problems in terms of spasticity, but technically cerebral palsy is implying that there was problems with brain oxygenation at birth, and, and we just now know that the cause was not that, um, but the problem in terms of spasticity can still be there. Um, finally, in terms of the medical issues, uh, the good news is that for the most part, there aren't significant ongoing medical issues. So for the most part, kids are healthy. Um, and there are a few things here and there that are, I think, at the end of the day, related fundamentally to the brain, but they do manifest in other parts of the body. So I'll go by frequency. Um, one of the most important ones to me are the eyes. Uh, one of the most common things that we see in the eyes is what we call strabismus. So you can see things uh, in terms of the eyes not wandering up or a lazy eye or a drifting eye. And you can see that just by looking at your child and see where they're, where they're gazing. Um, important to get evaluated, I think all children uh, with a pediatric ophthalmologist, ideally one who sees children with special needs. Um, it can be a problem that can be corrected surgically if there are ongoing problems with strabismus or in some cases a need for glasses that may help with visual acuity or how clearly you see things. Uh, really important to me for two reasons. Um, number one is to be able to learn well. You need to see your environment well. You need to take things in to learn them. And the eyes are actually the main sensory organ, the eyes and ears, the two main sensory organs to get information into the brain. Then the second is a safety issue. Obviously, if you can't see clearly where you're going and what you're doing, there are safety uh, issues involved. And obviously, injuries set us back. Um, finally, beyond that, a lot of kids have tummy troubles. Um, so tummy troubles in terms of whether it's constipation, diarrhea, reflux, or a combination of one or more than the above. I tend to see that it gets better over time, and that's in part because you, you sort of figure out life hacks, or what I call them. But it's a combination of diet, um, activities in terms of the more active you are, the more you keep things moving down there. Um, and then also, in some cases, medication. So medications basically for uh, heartburn in children, or um, medications that will help in terms of keeping things moving along. Diet really is important. Um, so I'll say a combination of things that are high in fiber of constipation an issue. Different children respond differently to lactose or dairy products. Uh, for some, it actually keeps them regular. For some, it leads to diarrhea. Um, for some, you may need to be on a lactose-free diet, and there are things you know that either have lactate in them or, or adding lactate to those dairy products. Um, but like I said, it's a little bit of trial and error, and I'm sorry I don't have a single sort of prescription for this, but it's a little bit of trial and error, but it definitely gets better over time. Um, there are some issues that we see in terms of endocrine problems. Those are largely problems in terms of gaining weight and being a little bit on the shorter side. Uh, again, some of that gaining weight can be related to tummy trouble in terms of kids not getting, um, just sort of not feeling well enough to be eating well enough. I will say nutrition is really important for those muscle tone issues. And so having children on a healthy balanced diet uh, is definitely helpful. If your kids are picky eaters, uh, including a multivitamin, a pediatric multivitamin, you can get it in a liquid form is helpful to make sure that they've got, you know, all of the things that they need nutritionally. As children are getting a little bit older, we are seeing some uh, orthopedic or bone issues. So whether these are things in terms of uh, needing um, AFOs, like I said, in some cases, or in when they're getting to teenage years or adolescence, we're seeing a little bit in terms of curvature of the spine or scoliosis. And we tend to see that again uh, with children who have problems with hypotonia. And so something to watch, um, mainly because if we need to correct things with braces, we want to do it early before it gets to the point of needing surgery. If you have to do surgery, that's a, a much bigger deal. Um, these other things that I said, heart issues, we, we do occasionally see structural heart conditions. Those are easy to see with an echocardiogram, and they're either there or they're not. And if they're not there, they don't come up in the future, so you can just cross that off your list. And in general, when we have seen it, they've been uh, relatively straightforward to treat, just like a hole in the heart in terms of either waiting for it to close or closing it. But they've been pretty straightforward. I will say one thing about COVID, um, because people have been asking me a lot 
about this. Uh, in general, our kiddos are doing basically the way all children have been doing with COVID. I haven't seen any more complicated complications coming out. Sometimes it does just take a while to recover from any sort of cold or virus. And in the same way, that's true um, for our community. Um, I will say that I always think it's a good idea in terms of the vaccine. The vaccine has been both safe and effective. It's not 100%, especially with some of the new variants that are going around, but it definitely, even if you get COVID with the vaccine, it's still making it a less severe infection. And I think in anything that um, sort of disrupts our kids ends up setting them back. And so the more we can do to keep them healthy um, by getting ourselves vaccinated and sort of being a barrier around them, or if they're 12 or older, getting them vaccinated is a good thing. Um, so I put in here just so you had a sense uh, in sharing with each other what fraction of the community is needing to use medication. To me, just the fact that you're using medication says something is significant enough that it, it requires treatment. For the most part, you'll see that these percentages are low, and, and that's a good thing to me that most kiddos aren't requiring medication, um, but they are in some cases for some behavioral issues that I'll bring up in a second, uh, rarely, but in some cases for seizures, uh, or as I said, some other behavioral issues and, and people are just uh, trying and, and trying different things in terms of using different types of medications. But for the most part, especially not for the young children, uh, most of the children are not on medication. So let me briefly um, describe uh, what I hope will be helpful, although the data are quite sparse. So I, I just want to caution you that, again, um, this is uh, an instrument that some of you have filled out, something called the Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Scale. I'm showing you the age of the individuals at the time of the survey completion. And then based on what you said in responding, this is what the kids are in terms of an, a comparable age equivalent. Um, these are different individuals for each of these different dots. So this is not one person over time, but these are different people in the community. But what I'm trying to show you is an expectation, sort of a trajectory of what development is looking like for our kiddos and trying to make it somewhat concrete by telling you some specific tasks that the kids are able to do based on achieving these different levels. Um, so we are see, seeing children make forward progress. That's one important point. Um, they are improving in terms of their verbal and their language skills. And then in terms of things that they are able to do with what we call self-care, again, improving over time in terms of feeding, uh, being able to feed themselves, again, very small numbers based on, on one 12 and a half year old. So uh, just realize that, but being able to make gains over time in terms of helping with dressing, undressing, bathing, showering. Um, so some important, I think, things in terms of making day-to-day -day life easier. And then in terms of social skills, again, um, because some people are concerned about autism, I do think individuals are doing a good job of connecting socially to others, being able to have meaningful interchanges, uh, whether it's with words or gestures, depending on the age, uh, but being able to meaningfully connect. Um, in terms of gross motor, so being able to move your body, um, again, smaller numbers, I would say this is more challenging at the beginning. And I think that's what we're seeing at the beginning. Um, as people are able to get through certain, break through certain um, sort of barriers, I do think things, um, you know, sort of move forward in a big way. So if you're able to walk and move and get around, you're able to socially interact with more people. And so being able to do one thing actually helps you do other things as well uh, in terms of development. But nice forward progress, I think we're seeing. Um, one of the other things we asked you to tell us about was what we call behaviors in terms of things that might be concerning. This first graph is for the little ones, so age less than five, um, and mild concerns are here. And the, the take home message is that uh, no one's really having concerns. Concerns. Even mild concerns were not hitting that bar for the little ones, so that's good news. Now I'm showing you the older ones, age 6 to 18, and we're just starting to get a couple kiddos that are having trouble with anxiety and attention. And so again, as they're getting older, doing more things, being exposed to more different things, I think we're seeing a little bit of that come out. I do think some of these we can help support, um, and anxiety, I think, is an easy way just to anticipate things, tell people when they're coming, what's going to happen happen, practice, doing social stories to prepare folks. Um, so I think there are ways of being able to deal with some of these challenges. Um, these are some of the things that uh, you were reporting to us again in the little ones uh, with different things. And I'm just going to quickly go through this because I know we're at the end of time. 
Um, and then for the older ones, some other things that were sort of four of your mind um, in thinking about these, um, but it's, it's basically the things I've gone over. Um, over time, what I hope to have are what I call spaghetti plots uh, for each individual. So this is now, this line is looking at a single individual at two time points, or in some cases, two age points, and showing what changes happen over time. Again, this is about behaviors and concerns about that. And part of what we're trying to do is keep this in the bank, so to speak, know what your child is like over time, so that if we start a clinical trial or we start some sort of intervention, we have a baseline. We know what they were like before, and we can now see if there's a change, either for better or for worse, but over time in terms of doing that. So we've been keeping track of all of these. And uh, for the most part, what I would say is, I'll, I'll be honest, the data are too sparse for me to make any generalizations, but we are starting to build this. Um, so within this, um, again, I, I, I won't take too much time, but just to say that overall, there are not major medical problems from my point of view. Kids are stable from a medical point of view, um, but it's a lot about education and supporting their education and development as we go forward. So within this, um, I, I just want to skip forward. We have something called the treatment program, which I think of as steps as we get forward to treatments and to clinical trials. Um, so we've been seeing the natural history here. I'll say through other ways I've been working in terms of making more sure more more kiddos get access around the world to the genetic testing that's necessary to identify them. So I won't go into those details, but I'm working very hard on that piece of things. Um, we're getting ready to start what I call natural history studies in person. So not just by collecting information online, but actually bringing people into medical centers so that we can literally see how the kids are walking or talking or doing different tasks um, so that we'll have standardized protocols for them to go through so that when we do get to the point of these clinical trials, we'll know exactly what we're measuring. Um, and, and there are some specific things. Nothing's difficult in terms of being invasive or challenging like that, um, but it's things like working with a physical therapist, uh, working with a neurologist, and being able to do different tasks and, and just see in the flesh how the kiddos are doing those. You're going to hear a little bit about this from the Tufts group in terms of the fabulous work they're doing that's now in the middle stages of this in terms of trying in mouse models, different therapeutics. But we've kind of got, we've been coordinating and keeping these two streams going in parallel parallel about what we're doing in the models, what we're doing in people, so that our timing will be just perfect so that these will come together and that we won't lose any time on the people side, um, so that when you hear from the Tufts group that they're ready to actually try something in people, that we've met them at that point, that we're ready to go. So what would we need you to do? Um, this is the most important part, actually, and you've been hearing a little bit about this, um, is that this is the website. So simonsearchlight.org is a place that you can go and go through this process. And importantly, for everyone in the community, you haven't seen this yet, but we're going to be sending out a survey in just after, just in the beginning of the fall, which is, I call it the voice of the community, and it's really your opportunity for me to hear from you about what you think would be an important clinical outcome for us to measure? What's meaningful? What would make a big difference in your lives? What are the types of things that you'd like to see in terms of being able to make things easier for your child or for you? And we're gonna use this as we think about the clinical trial measures and what we're gonna be doing as part of that in-person natural history study. So important for us to hear from you. This is your chance to vote and uh, make sure that you're represented. And then, as I said, these blood cells, and as we get to it, we'll be calling for volunteers to come in for those assessments. So I will stop there and we'll have time for questions at the end as well. Okay, great. And uh, with that, we'll hand it over um, to Dr. Michelle Jacob. Hi, um, I want to thank ACT and CISO for organizing our second annual conference. It's a it's a great opportunity to interact with the community. I'm really also thankful that we have participants that have joined us, made time to join us on a Sunday. So today um, I'm gonna to be talking about the work we've been doing. So this is going to be a presentation split between myself and Jonathan Alexander, who's a senior postdoc in the lab, who's done a lot of the actual experiments that we'll be showing. And we've been really focusing on trying to identify molecular and functional changes that occur in CTN and B1 syndrome, and then identifying drug treatments that can correct or amend the disabilities that go with this phenotype. And John and I have worked for many years on the beta-catenin protein, that's the protein product of CTN and B1. We've done different mouse models, usually targeting specific cell types to do gain of function, loss of function. 
And I would say about a year and a half ago, we were maybe two years ago, we were contacted by some family members and got very motivated to work together with this group to try to find solutions to these problems. So we got very interested in CTN and B1 syndrome as Wendy beautifully presented. It's predominantly a germline mutation and the most common phenotypes are the intellectual disability, the microcephaly of smaller brain size, developmental delays, particularly motor and speech delays, very weak trunk muscles, the weak muscle tone, often increased muscle tone in the arms and legs, sometimes spasticity, the mild visual defects. So these are the classic symptoms that are most common with CTN and B1 syndrome. And unfortunately at present, there's no direct treatment other than the things, again, that <laughs> go back, there's no direct treatment <laughs> because we really don't know enough about the underlying pathological changes. What is going on in the different cell types that cause these changes in function and part of this is that there are very few what we call preclinical models. So some people in the field have developed uh, appropriate models, but really haven't studied them with this in mind and really haven't studied them past, past embryogenesis, birth of the mouse. So we are focusing now our research on addressing these limitations. And basically what we're doing is we are generating and deeply characterizing two different preclinical models, an in vivo mouse model and in vitro human cell models that we'll be telling you about. And we are starting to test drug treatments for amelioration of the phenotypes we see in the mouse model. So basically I'm gonna give you just a small background. So CTN and B1 is the gene that encodes the protein beta catenin beta catenin is expressed in every cell of the body. It's essential for survival. If, if both copies of that gene were missing, it's not, um, the embryo isn't viable, it doesn't form properly. So we, we really want to understand its functions. And in particular, we're looking at two major cell types, neurons and skeletal muscle. And that's because we think those are the two cell types most relevant to the key symptoms or phenotypes we're seeing in individuals. And so what we wanna know is what are the molecular and functional changes that occur when beta catenin isn't functioning? And there's work from our lab, there's work from other labs that have looked at human and mouse studies. So we're using that as a beginning. But as I said, there's not a lot of in-depth on CTN and B1 syndrome, and that's because of the absence of models. So we have focused on generating models. So this is just a little bit of very minor background um, on beta catenin function. What do we know about this protein? Why is it so important? And what we know is that this protein is very critical for normal development of the brain for connections from one nerve cell to its target. And so it regulates the function of those, the communication at, at a synapse. The synapse is that special contact that's really critical for rapid information transfer. It regulates all behaviors, thinking, everything that your body does. So beta catenin functions in two major roles. It functions directly at the synapse in adhesion and in holding the nerve and its binding partner together. And it controls the number of synapses that are made, but also how well they mature, if they mature properly. And that regulates function of those connections that would affect brain function. In addition, some of the beta catenin goes away from this specialized synaptic connection and goes into the nucleus. And the amount that goes into the nucleus is dramatically regulated with activity at that synapse. And in the nucleus, which is sort of um, where all your DNA is, beta catenin plays a critical role in turning on the expression of particular genes in this signaling cascade called the wind signaling cascade. And that's also really important for proper development, guidance of connections in the brain, and for the plasticity that underlies things like learning and memory. So these are the core functions of beta catenin that are known and that are very relevant to the symptoms when beta catenin malfunctions. So um, as I said, we then got very motivated when we got in touch with ACT to start to develop a project that was completely focused on CTN and B1 syndrome. 
And with funding from ACT, pilot project funding, they provided the ability for us to generate a mouse model of this syndrome. This is um, a whole body deletion. And the goal of the work that we've been doing in, in coordinating with ACT is to figure out, is this a good model? Does it recapitulate the key features of CTNMB1 syndrome that we're seeing in the children? What are the molecular and functional underpinnings of these phenotypes? And now we have the ability to use that mouse to start to test drug treatments to look for safe and effective amelioration. We want to avoid adverse effects. And it's really, uh, as Wendy showed you on that um, slide about, it's critical to have in vivo models that will tell us that we are in a good position for beginning to consider true clinical studies. So at this point, I'm going to turn this uh, over to John and John is going to present the data on the mouse. John is, as I said, a senior postdoc in the lab who's done this work. I'd like to thank everybody for having us uh, on here today. And I'm really excited to share with you some of the research we've been doing in the lab with our uh, newly uh, uh, created clinical mouse model of CTNN B1 syndrome. <laughs> So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, do we actually have a reduction of beta-catenin in our mouse? So we've looked at basically two areas of the body that are obviously related to the core phenotypes of what you guys see in your children. And also we'll explore those phenotypes in the mouse a little bit later. But Importantly, we see about a 50% reduction in both the brain and in the musculature of these mice, suggesting that our beta-catenin heterozygote model or one de deletion of one copy of beta-catenin results in about half the amount of protein generated. So we've been using um, behavioral tests in these models to understand basically the cognitive and musculature type phenotypes and see whether they exist in these mice. So to assess cognition, we've basically used what's called an associative learning task or contextual fear conditioning for these mice. And the, the way this basically works is the mice are exposed to a novel environment. And then in that environment, they receive a mild foot shock. And the question is, can the mice learn to associate this new environment with the foot shock? And we measure that association by the behavior they put out, which is for mice, when they get scared, they have a little, they, they tend to freeze. So we're measuring actually the freezing behavior of these mice. And we do this, basically expose the mice to this environment with the foot shock over four consecutive trials basically to assess how well they're learning in between the trials. And then we assess the mice 24 hours later to see how they retain the memory. So when we look at the control mice here, we can see that over the course of all the trials, they tend to get learn to associate the environment with the mild foot shock and exhibit more freezing behavior at the end. And even though there's a small dip, they tend to retain the memory of the environment when they're exposed to it again 24 hours later. However, the beta-catenin and heterozygote mice actually do not learn to the same level of the control either during the learning phase or during the memory probe phase, suggesting that they do have a cognitive impairment. So this, and we have a very good number of mice now we've tested in this situation. So we're pretty confident of these results. Next, because of the uh, muscle tone problems in the kids, we also wanted to test uh, basically the strength of the mice. Not, uh, so we use a test that's called the grip strength. Uh, so basically the mice are allowed to grab onto a little bar and they're pulled slowly away from the bar. And it's what we're measuring is the amount of force they're able to put on this bar until they break free of their grip. So this sort of allows us to assess their sort of hind or forelimb strength. Um, 
And we take the average over three trials and also the maximum of those three trials. So what you're seeing actually in the little dots for the control mice, and you're sort of seeing their average, their results um, uh, for each individual mouse. However, when we look at the beta catenin and heterozygote mice, we see that both the average grip strength and maximal grip strengths are reduced. Additionally, we've also tested some mice on motor coordination. This is a, called a rotor rod. And basically the mice are exposed over three different trials to a raw, uh, basically a rotating rod. And what we're measuring is how long they can stay on the rod before they fall off. And as you can see, the control mice start to fall off pretty early, early in the trials. However, by the third trial, their latency to falling off is much improved. However, the beta catenin and heterozygote mice don't show the same motor learning skills, suggesting that they have motor coordination issues. However, their overall motion is not really decreased. When we look at their distance traveled or velocity in an open field task where the mice are just placed in basically a box and we observe their movement over 10 minutes, they really show no difference between the controls. So it's suggesting that really it's much more specific to um, the motor learning phenotype and the strength. So one of the things we obviously want to do is to be able to correct this. So at this point we begin, we've begun some preliminary studies testing a, a few different drugs um, to see if we can uh, ameliorate the phenotypes that we're observing in the mice. So sort of the way the drug paradigm works is we give the mouse the inje uh, injection of the drug for five days. And then after the last injection on, or one hour after the last injection, we move on to the behavioral test. And right now we're just assessing grip strength and the contextual fear conditioning to really just get two assays that are gonna be our evaluation of the, the motor, uh, motor and musculature phenotypes and as well as cognition. Uh, this has been shown in other work to be an effective model um, for these kinds of drugs. So again, with the contextual fear conditioning, um, the, control, the beta catenin and heterozygous mice that are treated with a vehicle, which is another way of saying just not the drug, um, show basically the same, a very similar phenotype, unable to learn, and then also a reduction in uh, learning at the 24 hour probe trial. So this is a first drug that we were testing. And remarkably, we actually see a very, very good improvement in cognition in these particular mice. They are basically not significantly different from the controls, suggesting that this drug potentially is effective, at least as far as the cognition goes. Um, and over on the right-hand side, you can basically also see the plots of indiv individual mice. And similarly, we see the same pattern as far as the vehicle treated uh, heterozygote mice, as far as the grip strength. Um, and then when we look at the drug treated mice, we actually do see an improvement in them. Although they're not up to the level of the control values, the control values are still significantly different from the drug treated ones. The drug treated uh, heterozygote mice are actually significantly improved over the uh, non-drug treated mice. So the, the take home message with this particular drug is that we are having some very, very uh, promising preliminary results. So when we treat these mice at a young adult age, about six weeks, we see improvements in learning and also motor capabilities and uh, muscular uh, capabilities. So with the good news, we also have a little bit of a bad news as far as the second drug we uh, tried uh, did not have really any significant improvements in either the contextual uh, fear conditioning or the uh, motor strength. But um, drug number one does look promising. 
and we are going to be assessing uh, several more drugs over the course of time. Uh, but we will be also moving forward, validating that first drug and moving on to larger and more expansive, probably cognitive and motor tests using that drug as a marker. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Michelle. Okay, so we're really excited by that preliminary result that was um, the two different drugs hit somewhat different targets. And so the first drug obviously gave us great enthusiasm. And so now I'll talk about where we're gonna go from here, from this result. So what are our next steps? Slide master. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we really want to extend the in vivo mouse study. So this, we, we've generated this mouse. It's a germline heterozygote. It shows really important phenotypes that are very similar to the children and, and the ability to use it to test the drugs. And so we want to know more now using this mouse, what are the underlying changes? We're, we're beginning to do this and we want to know the molecular and the functional changes. We're going to focus on the relevant cell types, predominantly neurons, different neuron types, and skeletal muscle. And part of the goal is not only to understand what are the pathological changes that give rise to the, the behavior changes and capability changes, but as Wendy said, we need biomarkers. When we finally get to the point where we're really running um, preclinical trials in potentially in individuals and in, in going to clinical trials, we want to be able to assess what molecules are, are at abnormal levels and how effectively the drug brings them back to normal levels. So this is something we're actively pursuing using the mouse right now. Another thing we wanna use with the mouse is what's known about progressive and compensatory changes. So we're gonna assess these molecular functional changes and, and behavioral changes throughout development and into adulthood. So another thing is that we tested two drugs. One looks fabulous, one is not as effective. We have at least two additional drugs that we are planning to test at present. It's possible, I'm talking to a chemist, we may um, expand that, but for right now we have two that we have on hand to test. And the reason we're testing multiple drugs is even from the two drugs, you see the specificity in the outcomes. We want to identify using the in vivo mouse model, what is the most effective drug treatment? Which drug or drug combination gives the greatest improvement in the capabilities? And then once we identify the best drug, we want to go to the lowest dosing regimen that's effective. That would be really useful. And we're going to test different time courses of treatment. We selected the young adults because they're really great for doing the behavior analysis. And the fact that it could correct the phenotype at that age is incredibly promising. So we wanna see how long do we have to treat for, what paradigm would be used for the treatment, and can we now correct the beta catenin levels and maintain the normal levels? And in very preliminary data, the first drug we tested did seem to correct beta catenin levels. We're still analyzing that data. And the second one didn't. So it's making sense for what the outcomes are. It's really important to us to test for adverse effects. If you just go back for one second to the previous slide. <laughs> so, you know, in any drug treatment paradigm, you wanna make sure there aren't off target effects. And that's something we're doing um, by treating both the, the heterozygote mouse and also wild type mouse and doing detailed studies on molecular changes. And we're going to assess age of treatment as a potential variable. So if we start to treat at very young stages versus adult, the young adult or older, do we get different outcomes? So um, now I'm ready. <laughs> so besides the mouse work, and that's an important in vivo model, we plan to do, we're starting to get ready to do some preclinical in vitro human cell work. So it's really well known in the field. You can find treatments that work well in mouse, but the critical thing is, will they also work in the human? And so to address this, what we wanna do, and Wendy started talking to you about this and, and where the blood samples will be critical, is there are methods that have been developed in the field where you can take blood cells, turn them into these, these 
pluripotent stem cells and then differentiate them. And we will differentiate them to neurons of the brain, neurons in the spinal cord, motor neurons that innervate muscle and muscle. And again, it's focusing on those groups that we think underlie the major symptoms that we think are important to correct. And that's based on conversations with the families. And I really like that Wendy said that we want your feedback on what you see are, as the most important phenotypes because we have to focus our, our goal to address what you think is most important for correcting in the children. We're working right now on learning ability and muscle strength motor capabilities. So to, <laughs> he's too fast for me, go back again. <laughs> so what we're trying to do right now without having the blood samples or the, the patient um, tissue yet, we're going to start with what we kind of think is going to be like a standard for comparison to us. So we have identified with collaborators, a particular human cell line that has been extensively characterized to have absolutely no pathological gene mutations. So it's been really well studied by other um, colleagues that are leaders in the field. And they are gonna work with us to delete one copy of the beta catenin gene in that cell line. And then we are going to start to characterize, we're gonna differentiate that cell, cell line into the neurons, the motor neuron skeletal muscles. So we have one cell line differentiated into different cell types. And then we're gonna do a characterization of the molecular changes and we're gonna to start to use the drug treatments in these cultures of these human derived cells to see what drug treatment corrects beta catenin levels and any associated molecular changes or biomarkers that we discover. Okay, so now I'm ready. <laughs> and once we have that, the next important thing is to go from this sort of blank standard in a way, the kind of gold standard to start to get to the patient-derived cells. So as Wendy presented in the data and we're seeing from the Simons registry that there is an array of mutations that can cause these phenotypes. And one of the important questions is to say, if an individual has a complete mutation of beta catenin versus partial, will they need the same drug treatment? So what we wanna do is start to select particular mutations that are seen in individuals with CTN and B1 syndrome and say, what are the beta catenin levels with a partial mutation is a product produced? Does it retain any of the functions of beta catenin? Because beta catenin has a protein that has multiple parts to it and different parts of that protein have different binding partners and different functions. And you might lose one function, but not another. So we need to know that to know what to expect for the changes we would see in function of that protein with a partial versus complete mutation and how we might want to correct it. So this is something we're going to test with um, the human derived cells to look at the molecular changes and does the same drug treatment work in both partial and complete mutations or do we have to sort of stratify individuals and treat them differently. So the idea of going through all of the beautiful data that you guys are providing is that Wendy and I are gonna to work together and we're gonna select the most representative, most um, often seen mutations that have the most characteristic phenotypes. And we're gonna start with a number of samples with both complete and partial mutations seen in the patients. We'll have blood samples from those children. And then we're gonna to work to differentiate those cells into the the neurons and, and motor neurons and skeletal muscle so that we can test the, the drug treatments that we identify. And as Wendy said, it's gonna be really important for the families to now start to provide the baseline information we need to say prior to drug, drug treatment, when we see these particular mutations, what is the progress that the child makes over time? What are the symptoms? And that, that's all data that's absolutely essential for us to be able to move forward to a clinical trial in the next few years. So um, the last bit of good news that we have, whoops, go back, no, no <laughs> next slide, <laughs> is that, um, next slide, there we go. So we've had some other success besides the great um, data that we're all excited about, 
we've submitted a grant to National Institutes of Health on this project. It's a small grant and R21 is a pilot project grant and it was really well received, very well scored and is the funding just started in July. So it's to work with the mouse model and to characterize it molecularly functionally. And it was to test that first drug treatment that we are working with. And so we're really excited because this will help us move forward. So just to give you a ballpark figure, I put on the direct cost, $287,000 comes directly to our lab to, to do these studies. And then the last slide is just overall funding of the lab. So we've been really fortunate and delighted to have funding from ACT. They've helped us get the data that you saw today because we wouldn't have had all that without their funding. We now have the R21 to help us continue. And we've been doing other projects in the lab looking at the role of beta catenin and associated proteins in cognitive autistic disabilities and a childhood epilepsy. So at that point, I'm very happy to turn it over to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Um, we are so, so excited by the results that we're seeing from that first um, drug testing and also really enthusiastic about um, the NIH grant. I think that provides a lot of legitimacy to what we're working on um, and feel very optimistic about the future for our community. Um, so thank you, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Alexander and Dr. Chung for speaking with us today. And with that, we're going to start the Q&A, um, which is going to be moderated by Kayla, who um, is going to either read questions off of the chat, or you can try to raise your hand. Um, there's like a little button you can press to raise your hand to ask a question, and you can direct it to either Dr. Jacob or to Dr. Chung specifically. Uh, hello. Um, so uh, just to reiterate, I think raising your hand, um, there's not really a way for participants to turn on their video. So the best way is to enter a question in the Q&A section in the bottom of your screen or send it in the chat. Uh, so the uh, first question that we have, um, but uh, is about the Tuff study. Um, are the tested drugs already FDA approved for other pathologies or are they experimental? So at present, they are not FDA approved. They are being used in multiple studies for different disorders because there's a family of drugs that we're testing. And the good news is that uh, there's a closely related drug that's been tested in healthy human volunteers and had no adverse effects. And so I'm in touch with the person who developed the drugs. They're aware of the results we have and very happy to work with us to move it forward to the point where, again, positioning ourselves to get FDA approval for a clinical trial. Thank you. Um, so another question we had kind of following up on that is what is the expected timeline for the next steps in the research? As far as the research itself or as far as getting to clinical? Or, sorry, the next steps, I think um, getting at the cell line testing and things like that. Um, I think that doing it as thoroughly and deeply as we hope to do, it's going to take a couple of years, but we have our eyes on the big picture of moving it to preclinical trials as quickly as possible. I think Wendy has a little more expertise in where you go from having a, a target, potential target, a potential drug to actually getting it into real clinical trials. So just to give you some ideas in terms of time frame for things, um, once a lead compound is identified by Dr. Jacob and her group, so the lead compound will be based, I think, on efficacy and toxicity. So both that the medication and the mouse seems to do what we want it to do and that it's safe. So it's not causing liver problems or heart problems or other things. So uh, Dr. Jacob, 
you know, can comment on that, but that's multiple years that that's not going to happen. I don't think in 2021 or 2022 in terms of being able to get that far forward. And then I guess one of the things I'm most excited about is because as Dr. Jacob said, another drug in that class has actually been used in normal healthy volunteers and been shown to be safe. I'm optimistic. I can't say it's a guarantee that exactly the lead compound or the final compound will be safe in humans. But one of the biggest things to me, even before we get to efficacy is safety. And um, I'll, I'll say one thing because it's something I've been in discussions with the FDA in terms of thinking. And the FDA frequently would prefer starting out in some older individuals. And then after they know in terms of safety in the older individuals backing down and see the younger individuals. And that's just the FDA in general um, worries in terms of little children with developing brains and developing bodies that it might do something different in them. So they always like to start with some older folks that are already developed. So whether those are 15 years old plus, but sort of in that age range. Um, one of the reasons I make this point is that there's some discussion going on in the chat. Um, you know, not everyone is on this webinar this morning and it'll be, you know, distributed so people can watch it asynchronously, but it is going to be one of these things we've got to band together. We've got to be able to internationally, whether you're in the UK or Australia or New Jersey or wherever you are, we'll figure out ways for people to be able to make contributions. And I do think we'll have certain people who will kind of take one for the team collectively, depending on where they are at the right time to be able to make a contribution. But it's with the idea that everyone's doing their part in terms of contributing um, and everyone's going to be able to make at the right time, a really key contribution. So for those of you who are in places outside the United States where it might not, you do one thing now and something else later, we're not going to leave anyone behind. I just want everyone to appreciate that. That's very important to me. But then once the clinical trials start, like I said, what I'm trying to do is make sure that we're in parallel while Dr. Jacob is taking things forward in the mice or in cells, we're using that time in people to know what we're trying to measure, make sure the kids can cooperate with the measurements, make sure that we fine tuned our instruments so that they're measuring change at the level of ability our kiddos have. And we may need to do some adjustments there, but I'm, I'm anticipating that could take us two or three years to do that so that when Dr. Jacob is ready, like I said, whether it's three, five, Five years from now, something in that time frame, we're ready to march forward. I, I don't know if I'm being overly ambitious, Michelle, but that, the, just off the cuff, I'm spitballing it. That's kind of what I'm thinking. No, I agree with you. Um, we're really excited and we are doing everything, working with you and uh, trying to move things forward. Um, okay, so we have some questions about, uh, can you, uh, disclose which drugs you guys tested already and any plans to test future drugs? So we have been told by multiple um, sources that no, we cannot disclose the drug for the okay. simple reason that at this point now it's becoming intellectual property. And for us to be able to get to the point where we can position ourselves to get clinical trials in place, providing that information publicly would limit that. So um, I, I cannot disclose the drugs, unfortunately, but at the time, once we have patents in place and um, certainly once we publish, obviously all those details will be made public. Okay. And we do have other particular drugs we are planning to test. Um, and I saw one question, does the drug pass the blood-brain barrier? And the answer is yes, that is known. The, the first drug that worked really well does get into the blood-brain barrier. And um, they asked if we're going to test dopamine. We could look for changes in dopamine. We're not targeting dopamine directly. There's another question in the chat. Thank you. And uh, do you guys have any thoughts on um, Gene, th gene therapy treatment for this population? I think that gene therapy treatment is something that's going to be very useful, but I think it's going to take several years more. And there are many groups that are developing approaches to gene therapy that I think are really effective and safer than what's out there now. The biggest problem is finding a way to get access to the right cell types in sufficient numbers to really correct 
what the gene change is, to not have off-target effects. And, and that's just, it's not in place yet. I know that fabulous groups are working on it and have really novel approaches, but it will take considerably longer than a pharmacological approach. Thank I'll you. Say I'll say I agree with Dr. Jacob there. I also think it's really critical. I just want to emphasize this. Most other conditions don't have the possibility of a medicine as what I think of as a bridge to potential gene therapy. I think there are many of us that um, are optimistic in the long run about gene therapy, but it's got several stages to go through to get to the point where it's safe and effective. And the one thing I get concerned about with gene therapy is once you do it, you can't take it back. And so, you know, with a medicine, it has, I think, a really huge advantage that you can try it. And if it doesn't work, or if it has a bad side effect, you can always stop it. And it washes through the system and you're not really set back. If we were to do something with this uh, gene therapy, and we were to have some sort of off target effect, um, that we can't sort of go back and then extract it and we're stuck. So I do think that, you know, what I could, this is what I have my fingers crossed about if Dr. Jacob is able to come up with something that's, you know, not a permanent solution, but a good solution and, and definitely makes things better. That's a bridge while some other conditions, some other neurological conditions who have similar features with us, they kind of blaze the trail and get some of the kinks worked out in the system until we find that it's safe and effective for gene therapy. So I, I potentially think we can have our cake and eat it too. Um, I will say that in terms of drawing other researchers specifically to beta catenin, everything that I'm talking about is trying to de-risk this. So in other words, what I mean by that is make it really easy for good researchers, even if they're not already working on our condition, to make it easy for them to work on our condition if they have the right technology. And that includes the gene therapy folks. Um, so I think the more that we can do that, and as I said, I will make sure to do my part that if you do your part, we'll distribute it freely um, and easily to researchers, whether they're industry researchers uh, around the world, uh, it, as long as your privacy is, is protected. I think I, my job is to try and make sure as many people see this and use this information to your benefit, and I'll do that. I would like to add one more comment about the gene therapy, and I'd say there's two comments. One is, it's very difficult to target the brain for gene therapy at this point in humans, even in mouse models, to get to the enough cell types potentially to really change the outcome. And the other thing is for this particular gene, overexpression of beta catenin also has negative consequences. That's something we've studied well in the lab and it, it has negative consequences in the brain, but also throughout the body, um, it will increase the risk of cancer, colon cancers. And so it's, one of the things we're paying close attention to in the lab is trying to optimize the drug that gives us a normalization of beta catenin levels, not an overexpression. And that's something that will be harder to control potentially with gene therapy. And we're certainly open to testing gene therapy approaches in the mouse model, but it's not something we're focusing on now because I think we're going to move a lot faster, you know, sort of the bigger bang for your buck by focusing on the pharmacology. And with this first result, it would be silly not to put all of our attention there right now. We have a lot of questions coming in about um, Simon's searchlight and the uh, specifically the blood samples. So is there a um, resource that we can share for people that have questions about um, their individual Simon searchlight process? Yep, I will. If you guys are going to send out a link afterwards to the recording or things like that, I'll send you an email address that people can figure out if they're stuck somewhere where they are and how to help them get through the process. Okay, great. And um, I saw one question generally about that. Does it matter at what age the blood samples are collected? The only trick is, is that we have to get them FedEx to the laboratory overnight to be able to make sure the cells are still living. And the reason why we're just having a little trouble with international shipment is sometimes the samples are getting stuck in customs. And then when the cells get to us, they're not living anymore. So that's why we're focusing initially on US or ones that we can get quickly to us overnight. Okay. And um, can you disclose how these samples are used in the project? Sure. So I'll, I'll 
do the first part and then Dr. Jacob can talk about what she's gonna do um, after we make them. As, as we were talking about, we can take a blood cell and we can actually trick it to make it think that it's at the very beginning of life, literally um, in a way that it can be made into any different cell type. And then we, researchers oftentimes make those, we call them uh, uh, pluripotential, meaning they can become anything. Um, they've got all potential uh, that they can make into. Um, for for beta-catenin, usually what we do is we differentiate them or we make them into brain cells. Brain cells in a dish, some investigators make them into organoids. So some people call those mini brains. They're not exactly like a brain, obviously, but they give some ability to be able to check certain things. Um, sometimes they actually will be able to look at the mini brains and see the size. And so for this, we'd expect those mini brains might be a little bit smaller um, just from what we know in the kiddos. Um, but with that, then they can test different ways of either increasing uh, with the medication for instance, increasing the amount of beta catenin protein with gene therapy, they can see whether or not they can have an effect. Some investigators even make networks of those cells and see if electrically they have seizures or what look like seizures. Um, so there are all sorts of you know things you can do that are not perfect. They're not humans by any means, but the big thing is that they're safe to be able to try different strategies and before exposing a human to the potential toxicity. So it's a good early step in the process in addition and in parallel with having models, for instance, the mouse models that Dr. Jacob described. Thank you. Um, and as far as uh, in the research world, can you talk about what um, any collaboration would be like, or if this is a possibility for any collaboration for international research um, partners? We do have a collaboration with an international um, scientists. So yes, we're we're constantly monitoring the literature and and looking at people doing work that is very relevant and reaching out to them. So we're very open to that. And yes, we have, as I said, one already in place. Great. Um. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just browsing the chat for any more generic questions. Um, any uh, super specific questions? We wanna keep this Q&A more general so it can apply to the broader community. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email us after, and um, but we're not able to answer anything specific or case-oriented. Um, Okay, I don't really see any other questions. If you have any other questions, um, please send them in now. Um, I'm just gonna jump in here, Kayla. I did see a question for Dr. Chung specifically about tethered cord. Um, and that is a good one because that's something we keep seeing coming up in the Facebook group. I think, um, Sean, can you scroll down? It was from Ashley Swift about um, tethered spinal cord or the fatty foam. Are you seeing that, Dr. Chung, in anything with the um, registry? Because that's, that's something that's coming up more and more frequently. So we haven't been seeing it, but um, or at least not seeing it frequently. I can think of maybe one or two. I'd have to go back and see, but the numbers are, it's very infrequent from what we're seeing so far. But again, I, there are many more of you out there on the Facebook group than who I'm seeing. So it, it could be a thing. And I encourage you definitely report it on your updates if you're in Simon Searchlight and it's something new that that's a new diagnosis for your child. Uh, there's one question about um, someone saw some res or some literature about having too much beta catenin can cause cancer. Does that have any impact or relation to um, CTN and B1 syndrome? So in CTN and B1 syndrome, the levels of beta catenin are lower than normal. And the drug treatment that we're using is to bring beta catenin levels up to normal. And we very carefully monitor the levels so that we don't have higher or excessive levels. Um, it is well known in the field that excessive beta catenin definitely increases your risk for cancers, certain cancers, um, colon cancer being one of them. And I will say that in 
very preliminary results. The first drug that we did looks like it brought the levels closer to normal, not high. And we were really happy about that. And that's why we're gonna keep the um, dose as low as possible and find the best drug because that is really, that's the balance. And that's why I was cautioning about the, um, the gene therapy approach. We really have to be able to regulate those levels. I'll just add, Michelle, that we once we sort of get our drug of choice, we're also going to be investigating the specific cell types where elevated beta-catenin levels are known to cause cancer, specifically the colon and the breast um, are two regions where beta-catenin mutations that cause increases in beta-catenin um, are known to cause cancer. So we will be evaluating that along with the drug later. Um, and then I have a few questions about um, some generalizations, if you found any trends so far. Uh, the first one, is there an average age that you see a C a children with CTN and B1 syndrome begin walking or begin um, speaking? Are there any averages for that kind of data at this point? So I'm literally just looking this up. I also just put in the chat the email address that people can get to if they're having any trouble with Simon Searchlight. So in terms of, it looks like using single words, there's a range, but it's going between about two and four for the individuals who are achieving that milestone. And then I think Walking, I would say we're still first. So walking without assistance, without holding on to anyone, I'm seeing it range anywhere from a year and a half to about six years. I hope that answered the question. And is there any data about CTN and B1 syndrome being linked with premature births? Um. Just looking back through my notes. So I'm not seeing a high frequency of premature, of either issues with pregnancy or premature birth. That's not to say that um, that can't happen or it can't happen at about the same frequency in the general population, but I'm not seeing anything that was reported through Simon Searchlight as being higher frequency than the general population. Is there any data that um, uh, this is that CTN B1 syndrome can be correlated with fertility drugs or any causes like that at this point? So there's nothing that we've seen that's a causative factor in terms of um, fertility treatments or medications. We sometimes do see a small effect of parental age, that is, as parents are getting older, um, that there may be issues like this happening. But and, and to the extent that that may be correlated with people using fertility treatments, it may be that. But we're not seeing a direct, at least we can't prove that it's a, any effect of in vitro fertilization or culturing embryos in a dish or anything like that as a cause and effect. I think we're about a wrap for uh, for the, the time that we have this morning. Um, I'm going to let Lauren close us out. If there's any further questions, you can always email us um, at info at curectnmb1.org um, or simply just go to our website and uh, you can find our email there and we'll try and follow up with any remaining questions or if anybody has more specific um, questions related to any of the material today. Um, so we wanted to thank, you know, again, Dr. Jacob, Dr. Alexander, and Dr. Chung for joining us. Um, we and Nicole and Alex, too, we are parents of children with CTN and B1. So like the rest of you, we are desperate to keep moving this forward so that we can help our kids. That's our chief um, motivation for doing this. And I think that, you know, as a result of these conversations, we all have a lot of reason to be really hopeful um, so that said, we're really always looking for people to volunteer to help us move um, the research forward. Um, 
whether you have a little bit of time to dedicate or, um, or more time to dedicate, we are looking for anyone that will help volunteer. Um, you can reach out to me directly through the info at CureCTNMB1 um, email address, and um, I'd be happy to discuss this further. We're going to be launching our new website. We'll be streaming this um, on our new website. It'll also be on YouTube. We did get some questions about translations. We'll look into that. Um, but just wanted to thank you all for joining us. We're super excited about the merger with Seesaw and all that we can do to continue to support this community from an awareness perspective and also in helping our kids in every way possible. So thank you all for joining us today and um, we're looking forward to continuing to move this forward. We have some really um, exciting exciting things ahead. So thank you all. And we'll post a link to the replay on the uh, the Facebook group as well. Uh, as soon as that's available, again, that'll be uh, posted on YouTube. Thanks everyone. Thank you, have a great day. Okay.